Hey guys, what's good? It's Wes. So recently, uh, there was a live stream that really kind of dug deep into a topic that I hold near and dear to my artistic heart, and that is values. So light and dark, how to balance them in a composition, how to show lights, highlights, shadows, bounce lights, all that stuff. Controlling values, in my opinion, is one of the ways that you can immediately level up your art skill. And the live stream was about a little over three hours long, and I wanted to take a snippet. So I was going to say a small snippet, but it's not small. It's one hour and 55 minutes long, but there's a lot of great discussion there. And this was open discussion. So live stream people were asking me questions as I was working and explaining my theory on how values work and how you can use them. Um, some easy to follow rules that you can use, but we also discussed the value scale, uh, why sometimes value scales can be misleading. Um, what's the most effective way to use, you know, a specular highlight versus a form highlight. Uh, so we kind of get into the weeds of it a little bit, but there's a lot of great back and forth and there's a lot of great aha moments. We also have live kind of uh, back and forth of creating bounce light situations and things like that to be able to, to discuss if our theory is correct. And um, it was a lot of fun. And I thought for this week's YouTube video, we can actually look at the entire one hour, 55 minute kind of live stream snippet, the archive. That way, if you miss the live show, but you want to get all that information in the way that it was presented, um, we can do that. So yeah, without further ado, go get yourself a, a, a nice, you know, snack, a drink, your favorite drink or whatever, and block out, you know, maybe have this on in the background, but one hour and 55 minutes of a deep dive with, with values, composition, the value scale, misnomers, um, kind of fables and myths about, you know, lights versus darks and checkerboarding and all sorts of stuff. So if you ever had a question about values, hopefully this nearly two hour live stream seminar uh, could be helpful. So uh, yeah, please enjoy. What's up guys? It's Wes. <laughs> so, so yeah, we're here. We are here. We are live by the power of the internet. Uh, this is actually the, the live stream that's happening on August 18th, but we have truncated it. So we are seeing a YouTube version right here. But as you can see over on the side, we have our live chat happening right now. It says we got 17 viewers. It's crazy times happening right now. So all of our good friends, whether it's on Discord or YouTube or Twitch, everyone's welcome. Um, and we are going to talk about value, value scales, misconceptions about value, crazy stuff like do, does anything break the value scale in theory, in practice, where does color fit into this, all that stuff. So this could be seen as kind of a, uh, you could maybe see it as a master class, but I honestly don't think I'm a master. I'm learning just like everyone else. Uh, I am a professional at it. I do this for a living. But that does not mean I know every single nuance that has ever existed. <laughs> but I can maybe answer some things or maybe shed light on a few things that might be um, kind of confusing. So first of all, even before we get into these notes and all my weird doctored stuff and like I have yarns everywhere, um, just know that we're going off the cuff. This is not pre, you know, the, I'm, I'm live right now. So... Uh, forgive me if some of the things get uh, slightly rambly or kind of all over the place, but I will promise to kind of bring it all together. And uh, yeah, we're looking at about 35, 40 minutes um, of kind of an open forum uh, talking about this. And that way, if I say something that might be confusing, um, maybe I can, you know, straighten up. Maybe I can, <laughs> maybe I can make it make more sense uh, and, and really kind of refine it into something that can be usable uh, no matter kind of what your art goals are. Okay, so yeah, like, yo, hey, everybody, look at this. See, we're so we're live. So what is value? Okay, so this is one of the first things that I want to break apart. So value is light versus dark. 
how light is something, how dark is something. However, there is also a thing called light and shadow. These are actually separate. So that's the first thing. The value scale and the idea of light and shadow should be thought of separately. A lot of people think the value scale shorthand for your lights and your shadows. Sure, it can be, but not always. Whenever you start getting into local values and you start getting into materials such as reflectivity, such as water, refraction, the way light bounces off things, the way light absorbs on certain materials, some of the quote-unquote value scale rules can be broken. All right? You have to think of them separate. But there's going to be another thing that really kind of pushes on that. But the first thing you have to think about is, yes, value scale, you know, whether it's 0 to 9, 1 to 10, 1 to a billion, 0% to 100%, whatever you want to look at, going from white to black, pure white, pure light to black, it is separate than dealing with your lights and shadows, the way light works and shadow works. Okay, I know I keep harping on it, but as we start going through this, hopefully you're going to see what I mean. So I actually have Sherry's uh, message here because I thought these were great messages to kind of look at, to kind of give us a starting point of uh, the discussion. Okay, so I know last time I caught a stream, Wes was talking about of five values being able to make anything. Uh, and actually, I've seen that concept even discussed some really art, old art videos like this, and then really great video she linked. But my question is, using five values actually better than using more than five? Does it make a composition stronger? Or do you think we are just imitating the light and shadows of a particular lighting scenario? Uh, such as what Wes was doing with the high contrast lights and the dark chiaroscuro. So the answer to all of these is yes, sometimes, and maybe. <laughs> so yes, um, I will discuss why I believe a smaller amount of values that you have to work with. Hell, instead of five, let's do three, like we did on last stream. Let's do pure white, 50% gray, and black. If you can design your image that it reads well, and there's no question about what somebody's looking at, whether it's a silhouette, whether, you know, um, big highlights are hitting stuff. Like if you can separate those three values to make an image, that image is going to be a rock star for sure, because you can tell what it is. The, the thing about, <laughs> the thing about images is you kind of have to look at them. It's like a quantum mechanics thing, right? The whole point of developing an image is to be looked at. So clarity is of utmost importance. We need to know what we are looking at. If we don't know what we are looking at, we get scared. Seriously, that's how horror movies work. That's why everything's so freaking dark. You can't tell what's going on. It's a bunch of loud noises. There's no light anywhere. It's horrifying. We need structure. And the value scale is a way to help us as the artist start developing an image in a way that is readable. That's that's all that's all it really is. Now, it can be more than that. It can lift, it can do heavier lifting. It can do all this other stuff and you can really get into the minutia, but at the end of the day, and I I believe Ivan kind of said this, but Sherry also said something as well. Ivan said that the numbers themselves don't matter. It doesn't matter if you have a five-point scale, a three-point scale, a 10 million-point scale. doesn't matter. And Sherry said the, matters, the numbers do matter. I'm here to say that you're both correct. So, But instead of thinking that the numbers, whether it's a nine-point scale or a five-point scale, how different... And how easily can you, as the artist, differentiate between your lights, your midtones, and your darks? 
Some people use three values. Hell, I've seen two value paintings. It's called Notan, N-O-T-A-N, literally pure white and pure black. Comic book artists do this a lot. Um, if you have Framed Ink, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. He literally builds all of his compositions with just a black marker. And he goes, boop, 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 boop. Here's a shape. Here's a this. Here's a that. Here's a that. And it reads well. It doesn't matter what it is, but the shapes read well. Does that make sense? Two values. You have a pure light and a pure black. That's it. That's how his mind works. If you need nine values, you're going from zero to nine or, or one to ten, you know, that that could be good. I prefer that one. So, and we'll, we'll, and we'll kind of go to the finale of what Sherry discovered um, here in a little bit, but let's take a look at this, okay? If we have a grayscale ranging from zero to 100, every 10% you're adding a little bit more dark. Now, if you have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, there's your 10 point scale. However, normally scales work in nines. Whenever you look at this kind of percentage based value scale, it's usually a nine point scale, either starting from zero and going to nine or starting from one, meaning 10%, and going to 100%. There's only literally one reason why that was discussed, that that became the thing. The nine point value scale is the quote unquote standard. And I wanna see if chat can get why. Why do you think that is? The answer is so easy. The moment I realized it, I felt like the biggest idiot on the planet. But once I realized it, it was kind of a game changer. Because I, I, I'm, I'm curious if you might know. So let's say we got rid of the zero right here. Okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. And then you got 10. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Why would that 9 point value spell? Because one value and one value mixed equals one new value. So kind of but let's say let's say these are all completely separate let's say the 10 percent 20 these are very and the, never the two shall meet that they can't blend that they don't like they are they are structurally by themselves why would a nine point value scale in here let me actually do this um let me let me do that that that'll make it a little bit easier so we're, we're gonna just get rid here we go. We're going to get rid of this one. And the, okay, so we have a nine point value scale here. Why is this the most adopted one? Does anyone know why this is the most kind of popular value scale to create things with? And once I show you the, the like inside the matrix of it, you're going to, people like that. Okay. So there's one, I mean that, you know, that's probably as good of a reason as the real reason. Um, but there is structurally a reason why. Cause we already got that. Okay. So alien says we already got this here in the blank canvas. So maybe, maybe. And we'll, we'll also talk about with the value scale that pure 0% and pure 100% don't really exist in nature. So whenever digital artists use pure white and they use pure black, that's what makes your art look fake and like digital because you're always going to have light bouncing off something and you're going to be picking up things. So there's never pure white, never pure black. But back to this question, why is there a nine point um, value scale? Okay, I just assume people were not aware of the nonlinear scale. So we'll talk about that in a second because... Uh, here I put these are equal steps, but this is not quite accurate. And we will talk about that in a minute. But this is easy, right? Easy to look at, easy to kind of know, whoop, know kind of what we're doing. So a nine point scale. So I'm about to give you the answer on why people use a nine point scale. You guys ready? Because five is in the middle. 
That's it. One, two, three, four. That is your light spectrum. 50 is your midtone. Six, seven, eight, nine, like 10, essentially, is going to be here. So your 50 is in the middle. On a, on a nine point scale, on a nine point scale, five is in the middle. The only reason why that matters is it helps you keep things separated. Does that make sense? That's it. That's the only reason people adopted this. Because five is in the middle. There's no other like physics, oh, the quantum mechanics of prisms of light. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. It can be. So now you're seeing why the numbers don't matter. Do you see what I mean? Because yes, on this one, five is directly in the middle. You have one, two, three, four, five on this side, and then one, two, three, four, five on this side, but that's 11 points. Because this is the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is still a ten point scale. So this is actually an eleven point scale. Count the count the blocks. The same reason these numbers. So if we really wanted just nine points, here's nine points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, nine. Yeah, there's always one right in the middle. So if you go one, two, three, four, then this would essentially be five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's a nine point scale. You have four on one side, four on the other. So this is what I mean by the numbers don't matter. So you never, so, but the weird thing is that you never get to 10 by mixing because you don't need to. This is where equal steps, not quite accurate. This is what exponential literally means. The darks drop off so much faster than any of your lights or your midtones. You could have a billion values between your lights and your midtones. Once you hit that, I guess, like event horizon on your darks, it's all, it all just plummets. So even right here, you can see once you get from zero to like 70%, you're still kind of, yeah, you have some highlights and stuff, but this is a lot of midtones. But then whenever you get to your darks, it just poosh. But this is why this is not quite accurate. But if you look in your painting program, um, let me move chat real quick over here. If you look in your painting program, those darks just hit like crazy. Right. Like, so yeah, 10 to 90 makes more sense because there's no black and there's no white. So if you take those off, there you go. Um, but the, the blacks drop off real fast. Okay. So now we talk about why does any of this even matter? So let's say you don't have any numbers. You don't have any numbers to know about this percent and that percent and this percent and that percent. The real reason why you want to differentiate your values is so you can always keep separate your lights, your midtones, and your darks. Notice I didn't say your lights, your midtones, and your shadows, because shadows can be pretty bright, depending. And also, your highlights can actually be like an 8 on a value scale depending on what your image is. This goes into the most important thing about value. The most, by far, no question about it, 
Value is always, 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 always relative, just like color is, all right? It's always relative. So where we start getting into relativity is bounce light. So if you're thinking of your value scale in the sense of, oh, my lights, anytime my lights come into play, it's either going to be a zero or a 10. And then, okay, let's say my, my highlight is like a 10. Let's say my midtone's a 40. And then my, uh, my, my, my shadow is a 90. That's all well and good. But now what happens if you add your highlight, your 10, to your 90, your shadow, where does that put you? Well, we cut the difference. One, one, two, two, three, three, and a 50, right? But depending on the material, depending on the reflectivity of what's giving you bounce light, 50 might be way too bright. It's not at 10, it's not at the uh, almost white, but it's also a far cry from 80 or 90. Like 50 almost seems like the sun is out compared to 80 or 90. You know what I mean? So now you have to do some algorithm. You have to do some math. You have to, do, and really what looks good, what looks right. Because even if the, the head of a candle could be a 10 on your value scale. It could be the brightest thing, or it could be at 10% or zero or whatever you want to call it, your lightest thing on the value scale, the very tip of that fire. But how much light does it emit out into the air? Not much. So you're telling me that if you had an orb or an apple next to it, the apple would be at like 90% dark in the darkness, and then you have the candle right next to it, so then like bounce light would be at 50 and 60%. Oh, hell no. That's way too bright because that candle don't have that kind of push as far as light emitting. You'd be like 80%. It would be lighter, but not as light as your light source. There's no way. It's impossible unless you're at the sun and you're holding up a mirror and it's reflecting back the light source directly at you. Nothing will be brighter than the light source. Nothing. It could be close. If you have a reflective ball, if the ball is made out of a material that shines light, it could be close, but it still won't be. You might have a specular highlight that's as bright as the light source. But otherwise, you're going to have your full chroma of color and all that stuff around the 20 or 30. This is where it's relative. You have to look at the scene. You have to look at the surroundings. You have to look at the things around it. What does skin do? Does skin reflect light? Well, kind of, and it depends on your skin tone, right? Darker skin will absorb more light than lighter skin. I'm the palest person to ever live, probably. So I like reflect light at the beach. It's like looking at looking at a mirror is basically what, <laughs> what seeing me at the beach is like, right? So you have to keep that in mind. There's so many nuances to this, but the thing to remember to keep this as easy as possible, don't mix your value ranges. Don't mix the ranges up. So let's say you had, and we're gonna look at some actual examples here in a minute, and we'll kind of come back and forth between the value scale so we can compare this. So I know saying it's one thing, but looking at it's a whole different thing. Let's say instead of going, okay, my highlights are at the 10, my midtones are at the 50, and then my, my, my shadows are at the 90. Think of it like this. My highlights or my light, the light in the scene, the whole light in the scene is gonna range from 10 to 40%. Anywhere in here doesn't matter what the value is. These are my lights. Now my midtone, and hell, you don't even need a midtone really. Let's say my midtone is 50 and 60. Those two. Blend between those all you want. That's your midtone. And then your 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 shadows, your darks could be 80, 90 and 100. 
So you're using the range. You know what I mean? Like, as long as you're within that wheelhouse, as long as you're in your lights, as long as you're in your middles, as long as you're in your shadows or darks, then you're going to get something that feels correct. You can do some nuances and stuff. And then where it starts getting tricky, let's say you have a vast landscape. What if the shadow value of the very distant mountain becomes the mid-tone value? Because whenever you have atmospheric perspective, contrast lessens. You have less contrast. So instead of having your highlights be at a 10 and then your shadows being at a 90, let's say your highlights are at a 40 and your shadows are at a 60. Those are condensed. Those are crushed, right? Th those are so close together, but that's correct because you have atmospheric perspective that really just brings them all. And that's where color can come in to help you differentiate, which we'll talk about. But just think of the value scale as something to kind of pick from as a menu of options. You can also, here's a thing that blew my mind and we're gonna look at some examples in a minute. What if this was your value scale? What if 60 was your highlight? And seven, and let's say, yeah, and let's say 80 was your midtone, and then, and then the 100 or the 90 was your shadows. As long as you keep these separated, you're fine. Same thing here. What if, what if this was? my value scale. What if my shadows were at 30% and my midtones were at the 10 and 20 and then my highlights were at the zero? Does that make sense? Th that's fine. It still follows the rules. Might be kind of hard to see, but I literally did a card for Varia with this exact value structure. My, v my shadows in the picture were at 30% opacity or 30% of, uh, you know, dark, I guess. See, and not even necessarily. The contrast actually read, re that was my only worry about working on white out for Varia, is I was like, I don't know if this is gonna read well, and it read great. Whenever we printed it, it was perfect. And I was like, okay, I have a lot to learn. Because that's it. So perfect example. Let's see, where are the other notes? Okay, so I have my, my list of people including my stuff right here but there's something i also want to talk about before we dig in because we're going to be bringing up color a little bit i'm going to try to shy away from the color side of it but we're going to discuss it a little right so sherry brought up is there an instance where two colors blend and create the same value and yet a different color and that answer is a whopping resounding yes that is where things like warm versus cool come in. Literally, if you have traditional art supplies, if you have oil paint, if you have watercolor, if you have whatever, this is the exercise you should do is you should get your darkest green and your darkest red, mix them together and see what happens. Okay, dark on dark makes darker. That makes sense. But is there a, a breaking point to that? What if you had 10% of this green in 90% of this red, does it stay a little lighter? Does that value change at all? That's what, this is what color theory really is, in my opinion. How are the colors and the combining of your temperatures adjusting your values? Is it going lighter? Is it going darker? What's happening to the saturation? Yeah, if you're mixing two equal parts complementary colors and you have one warm and one cool, and it's pure exact 50-50, you will get neutral gray every time. But only if it's a warm on one side and a cool on the other. So it has to be a warm red and a cool green, and then you'll get the gray. But if it's a warm red and a warm green, you're getting brown, homie. That's where color theory starts messing with people. It may even lighten the value a little bit. 
because like quinacridone is going to be different than cobalt is going to be different than cadmium is going to be different than zinc is going to be dip all of these things have different properties so you have to test them if you're working in a traditional sense you have to see what happens when you mix them you have to be a mad scientist because not only is it going to affect the chroma and the saturation and like the the vibrancy of your colors it literally adjusts the values as well but yes, you can get it exactly right. And that's part of the exercises. You can make the exact same values no matter what color it is. There's the old saying, value does the work and color gets the credit. If your values are right, you can be any color on the planet and it'll look right. In fact, a vast majority of my art heroes are colorblind. I didn't even know that until they would reveal it. Like Paul Canavan, he's worked on magic. He has great stream, great guy helped me out whenever I first got started. And he's just a genius guy, colorblind. You wouldn't know it looking at his paintings. Li Xin Yin, one of my favorite painters ever. You know, he's worked on Assassin's Creed and he's tutored with Craig Mullins and all this other stuff. Colorblind, you wouldn't know it, but all they work with is value. But their colors are on point because value's on point, right? And that neutral gray will be equal in value to the original colors, yes, but what if the two colors are different values? Because remember what chroma is, every color lives in a certain place. If you have yellow, that is way lighter than ultramarine blue. So even if it's blue and yellow and they contrast and one's cool and one's warm, that's going to be a lighter midtone. Because that yellow is going to overpower the crap out of that blue. Was the act of changing hues along with values? It can be. But you can also get a... There's this thing called vibrating colors. And what happens is whenever you have two colors that are different chromas and different um, intensities, but they're exactly the same value and they're right next to each other, it will give you a headache because your brain doesn't understand what it's looking at. It happens very rarely, but you can do it. And there's a lot of like contemporary artists that do it. In fact, that's sort of the idea behind those 3D magic eye things, where it's like, all right, can you see the green letters in here? And it's all blue and red splotches. That's all value. That's just a value exercise. If you grayscaled that out, you wouldn't be able to see it because it's all the same value, but your eye has to differentiate you know, those colors. But that's another part of contrast. And that's how you would make a division of if you have overlapping values, let's say you had that distant landscape and it was lighter. So the shadows were actually the same value as the midtones. While, yeah, in black and white, that might be kind of confusing, but that's why you use your sky color, your blue, your whatever. You give it the contrast of the color, the hue shift, to be able to easily be able to read this. You know. More blue without touching the value makes your color look darker in comparison. Well, that's because blue is dark. Blue is the darkest part of the color wheel. Like, and it's not even close. Because every color has an innate value. Every single color. Like Coca-Cola red is mid-tone, baby. That is mid-tone 50% gray. As through and through. So like, that's the other thing. That's where all of this really starts big braining. Is like, if you start realizing that every single color choice you make has an implication on your values. You really start stepping back and you're like, okay, what color am I going to choose? Because this is a way bigger decision than what I thought. And of course, because of the way the rods and the cones in our eyes work, blues recede. Your cooler colors tend to recede while your warmer colors tend to come up front. So then you have that optical illusion. Because every time I say, oh, cherry red is 50% gray, people are like, that's BS. And then they go and they test it in Photoshop and their jaw drops because they're like, oh my God, why didn't I know this? Because red is so intense that you could swear, you could swear it was either lighter or darker. You know.
So yes, in, in my second color theory course I'm making, I talk about that hue, saturation, and lightness. So what if you have the additive color wheel versus the subtractive color wheel? So what if you have, you know, red, green, blue for your digital screens versus cyan, yellow, and magenta? Like what happens? Why do those work? Why do they not work? Like what's a cool thing in between them? So we're going to talk about that too. Um, but yeah, that's coming up in the next color theory course. So, so yes, just think warm versus cool. You can absolutely mix colors and keep the same value. It's very tricky though. You really have to know your stuff. You have to know how much of this versus how much of that, but it is possible. It is definitely possible because that's how you, people brought up John Singer Sargent. That's why he's so freaking good. And that's why he would scrape paint off if something wasn't right. He would be like, nope, that value's off. Nope, that value's off. Nope. And he would go back over and over and over and over because he would mix his paint before he put it on the canvas. He wouldn't blend. No, 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 no. He would not blend. He would mix on the palette. And then he would look and stare for nine hours at a time and come up and go, boop, one little deal. There's a YouTube artist. Well, I say YouTube artist, an artist on YouTube named Mark Carter. Um, his uh, website, if you look up, this channel, Draw, Mix, Paint. Um, he has a method of painting, which is literally by using the sight, um, like a sight lens. And you don't put a mark on the canvas until you have that exact same color and value. Exact same. It has to be identical. And people are like, oh, well, it's paint by numbers. It's paint by numbers. That's how the old masters used to work, man. So... If you, if you look at that and see just how good and how realistic and representational that oil painting style is, it's unbelievable. It completely changes your mind about the relationship between color and value. Okay. So I mostly use HSL slider. It's straightforward. Also, you should group your values, but you can shift your hue. So even in grayscale, you would show the same. The hue would give you two different tones in the shadows. That's correct. So once again, the warm and the cool. If you just simplify it that way, Hey, do we need more heat? Do we need a little bit more cool? Like, what do we need? Does that need to recede a little more? Like, what's going on? That's where a lot of this starts coming out. Okay. So, now let's talk about... Okay. So, we talked about relativity earlier. This is the type of thinking that I want you to ask while you're painting. Because this is... I literally ask this to myself mentally all the time. After your initial block in, so this is after you already have kind of your subjects where you want them, you have your lights in the back or however your value scale is going to work. Darker, you know, in the forefront, your midtones are in the middle, of course, and then your, um, let's say your background is lighter. You In the very Magic the Gathering, D&D style illustration, concept art stuff, um, that's what you're going to go with. Once you have your stuff blocked out, then you start to ask the more relative questions. So instead of being like, this is my light and this is my shadow, think of it as, is this lighter or darker than what's around it? Is this lighter or darker than what's around it? Because we talked in, I think a few weeks ago, on the foreground, whenever it's really dark, you don't want to put a super bright highlight. Not unless there's a very good reason, because you just destroy your value scale. You just destroy it. But you can make that shadow a little lighter. Not quite as light as your midtones, but you can bring it up a notch. Sure. That shows that light is being cast onto these things. But it's not going to match your 50% or your 40% or whatever. You're still going to be pretty dark. So your darks, your midtones, and your lights should never really cross paths. They can. Never say never in art. I've seen some crazy stuff, but real life has crazy stuff. Go try to mix a very neutral, very natural green. It's almost impossible because it's that that's the perfect balance of saturation, chroma, value, the way light hits it. Like it's very difficult. That's why a lot of artists, especially digital artists, don't like using the color green. They don't like it because it looks fake. The one that you get on Photoshop and the one that you get in this color wheel, this is a fake ass green, man. This is like clown car green. 
Nobody uses this green. Let me. Like, oh man, I want to get a green, but man, uh, your natural greens are going to be more around here. That's where your greens are going to be. But look how dark that value is. But it's still punchy. So reflective light bounce light would stay near the darks and be in the shadows. Bingo, bango, bongo. You got it. So, perfect example. Let me just, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this up real quick. It's going to be very bad, okay? I am going to hide um, chat real quick so we can get this, but I'll bring it right back. Um, let's do this. That's fine. Let's do this. Okay. I'm going to 50% gray this because, of course, I am. Um, let's fill this with 50% gray. Cool. All right. So we have this, right? Yeah, I mean, green deserves its own chapter. <laughs> it's super difficult. That's But that's why I like to try to embrace it. Because if I can nail it, we're getting somewhere. All right. So, reflective light. Let's talk about this. So, um, let's do this one is fine. We're going to go a little bit darker. Okay, edit, fill. We are going to do foreground color. Okay, here we are. So relatively dark as far as our, our first uh, deal, right? So let's come over here. We are going to do this. So really it depends on the material. The material that you have, if this is a matte ball, meaning it doesn't really reflect light or anything like that, um, you'll get lighter up top, but really the thing that affects it more than anything is your color chroma. You're going to have the most chroma where the highlight is. Um, but very famously, people like to, if we do this, let me grab, um, let's do, uh, yeah, West Painter Lunch. Sure, why not? It's not going to look great, but we'll do it. Okay. Say we're getting, we have this. We have Terminator line. So a nice thing that you can do. So yeah, let's go ahead and do this. This soft round. All right. So we have something like this, right? A good trick you can use and it's never really failed me okay well and then of course you have your uh you can't forget your cast shadow actually let me bring it right there go like this can't forget that one and then you go real black you go boop ambient occlusion all right Ta-da! We have a sphere and it's looks so cool. Look at that. All right. We have that. Let me come back up here a little bit. Now it's going to bug me. So I'm going to fix this. It's very rarely. There we go. So we have the form. Sure. Let's do that. There it is. So see how me taking that highlight out actually made that look way better. Um... That's a thing about values too. Okay, cool. So we have our sphere. Great. You have your specular highlight. That's going to be the lightest. Then I have my cool midtone, and you can see I have a few midtones here. So the values are here. My shadows are right here. Sure. And then you got your your harshest shadow, uh, your cast shadow right here. Ambient occlusion, all that stuff. There's no light getting here. A very decent, decent technique that you can do. It deals with, I'll tell you the algorithm to how to really find out exactly what value to get first. And it has to do with your background. Because if light is reflected, what light is getting reflected? The light from the surroundings. Right? That's the only light to get. I mean, how else is it going to get reflected onto your surface? It has to bounce off something. So it's bouncing off of things to get back to your object. Right? So, it can't be as light as the light source. 
it also cannot be as light as the things around it. So it can't be as light as this because this is acting as the light source. It's getting reflected light. So you're not talking about, you're not talking about this light. You're talking about this light. So automatically, if we make the value jump from this right here to this, what is that? Probably two jumps, two or three jumps on that value scale. Maybe even, yeah, probably three, right? So the very lightest, the very lightest this could possibly be is three jumps up because we're using the same equation. If that is three darker in the shadows, we could go three lighter, but that's the extreme. So if we're at an 11, let's go to 34 and see what it looks like. It's okay, but it's kind of overkill. Do you know what I mean? Like that still doesn't quite look right. So that also means, because if we're here at 50 and then we were at 30, that's only a two jump. So let's bring this down to 20, like a 25. Actually, let me get that. Let me bring this back so you can actually see it. Okay, 25 or 22. There you go. Now we're getting somewhere. Because we followed the rule we already established. From the specular highlight, the rest of the room is getting hit with the same light source as this. As the specular highlight on the thing. And this deals with speculars. This is why materials are very important. Because reflectivity and all that stuff is going to change this algorithm. This math that you're going to do. From this to this, we went about three steps, about 30%. Okay, so that's 30% darker. Now, by the nature of the way light works, as it goes through the distance, as it pings off of things, it loses a percentage of its intensity. You just, I mean, that's why the top corners of your house, even if you have lights on in the living room, is going to be darker because light has a harder time reaching there. It's, it's bouncing off everything. So it has a harder time reaching these small corners, which explains things like ambient occlusion, places where the light doesn't get at all. So if we use that same method, that's a 30% difference. This has to be a 30% difference because this is now our new light source. Because we're talking about reflected light, not the primary light source, not your key light. But this is your this is your 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 fill light, if you were, if you come at it from like a photographer. So this is our light source. It needs to be 30% darker. So then we could do that math again. If we needed this to be for whatever, if we wanted to come and bring this back, if we think this is a little intense, I would grab this. It's at 21. Uh, so I would say, okay, if zero to 20 is my 100% scale, this is where the value scale comes in. Zero to 20 is my scale. And then 20 is my lightest light. Now, this is now considered in my mind my lightest light. And I'm going to get 30% darker than that. What is that? Three, six, what is that? 30%, that'd be six, right? We'd, we'd go down six-ish. Is that correct? I'm terrible at math. My wife is the math teacher. I got into art because I'm bad with numbers. <laughs> so let's subtract six from that. So let's go down to 14. See how it's a little bit more natural now? A little bit more, right? Then we can actually bring that, grab that again, kind of reintroduce it here. Light keeps almost like quartering itself in intensity as you go a certain distance. 
it's like one fourth as strong. And then from here to here, it's one eighth as strong. And then from here to here, it's one sixteenth as strong. And from here to here, like there is an actual algorithm. Now, as an artist, you can make that algorithm. It can be whatever math you want. You just have to follow the rules you establish. So this goes into the whole idea of, all right, I don't care if my art is realistic. I care if it is believable. Believable means it follows certain rules that can mimic reality. Bouncing light, that mimics reality. Now, if I took this into a scientific method, would my drawing be correct? Probably not. So it's not realistic, but it is believable. That's where the value scale can come in. But you can see what is the difference between okay any guesses on this right before the terminator your darkest point right where the light stops hitting that's where the light is terminating right and then we're going to round the corner away from the light so that's what this darker line is it's called the terminator is this value right here right before the terminator and this value right after the terminator are they the same? Remember, we're in grayscale, we're not using color, we're not doing any warm and cool bounce light. I'll, 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 I'll bring up uh, bring up stream real quick just to see if anyone wants to anyone wants to answer. Are these going to be the same? And remember, this is just this example. This isn't going to be the rule for everything forever, but just, okay. Okay, Ivan says no. Ivan says no. Sherry says no. So let's define it. Will it be the exact same like percentage? Probably not, but will it be within like a half step, 5%, let's say. So is it gonna be in the same area? And then Ignean says, yes, okay. Let's check, let's check it right now. So, and of course it also depends on what pixels. So what I'm looking at right now is I'm gonna look at this. I'm going to look at my, my value slider. So they look the same, that's a great point. They do look the same. This, right here, right before, is at 18%, 18%. Keep that number in mind. We're gonna come after the Terminator, back into kind of this bounce light. 16%. So guess what? It's the same value. But why does it work? Why does this still read as three-dimensional if this is a mid-tone and this is technically a shadow? Why does that work? Because this is one of the one, the only times, and we also see it on a landscape in a minute, you can cross your values, but just once just in one area, okay, value relativity. This is the lightest part of the shadow. This is the darkest part of the midtone. Does that make sense? So on our value scale, a 40% could be both your lightest shadow, but also your darkest midtone. That's why it can bridge the gap. Always think of blending, always think of these type of things as a bridge. Does it bridge into something else? Does it like take over? You can get lost edges, you can get uh, you know, soft edges, and then if it's relative here, but you need something to differentiate the two. 
And the thing differentiating these two for us right now is the Terminator. The Terminator is giving us that sense of form. It's giving us a sense that, okay, it is going away. And also, that's why a specular highlight does kind of some heavy lifting. Does some hell, yeah. So it's relative to the shadows. This is the lightest part of the shadow, but this is the darkest part of the midtone. And then the thing that really literally cuts it down the middle is the Terminator. And it follows the contour line of the shape itself. So this is the extreme of a bounce light. This is the, the very limit, in my opinion, Unless, of course, we're on a window, like if this down here is a mirror, then this will actually be closer to uh, the 50% gray that we have on the background because it's a perfect, like, it is its own light source at that point. It's reflected on the light source. There will be no ambient occlusion. It kind of breaks a lot of rules, but that's why a lot of artists don't mess with mirrors all that much. Um, it's a very optical thing. It's all relative, right? So... Yeah, that's, that's one of the better things to note, but it's like, that's still the extreme of a bounce light. And at the, at the lightest light it can possibly be, relative in this situation, of course, the lightest light it can possibly be is equal to the darkest part of the midtone. It can't be lighter than the darkest part of a midtone. It can't be, or else it looks wrong. We already looked at it, it looked wrong. So that's the darkest area of the room being reflected in the object's shadow. So no, um, of the room being reflected. So, well, I mean, it depends on the room, but really it's just what's around it. So if this, perfect, a oh, great example, let's do this. If this, was black. Um, let me go ahead and just color. So this is kind of proof that it's all relative. Okay. Um, not that one. I need. Oh, it's locked. Boop. I'm gonna come in. I am going to basically let me uh bring this up. I am just doing a quick color overlay. And I'm going to turn this black. Okay. So one, that shadow doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so I'm going to kind of get rid of, uh, let me, I'll hide uh, this real quick. So I'm gonna get rid of this value composition because now it doesn't make sense. Now this does not make sense at all. Because let's go here. We have the Terminator, right? And then we have our shadow. Okay, what color and actually, let me... That's probably wrong. Oh yeah, because I... Actually, let me go boop, 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 boop. Let me undo all that. Cool. Okay, so here you go. What will be the color of this bounce light? Yo, Michael, what's up, man? We're in the thick of it, bro. Welcome. So what would what would the what would the bounce light uh, color be here, or color? What would the value be? What would the value um, be? Let me turn this on. Yeah, this is space lighting right here. <laughs> this is the middle of the middle of the solar system. And re and remember. Uh, values are relative, always, always, always. So Ivan says, if the space around it is pure black, there's probably no bounce light. That is absolutely correct. What light? What's bouncing off of it? Nothing, right? Nothing. Yeah, there's nothing around it. There is nothing for the light 
to go bing and ping back onto our object, even though it's able to have a highlight. Now, this probably wouldn't exist super well in the real world because something that would give this type of specular highlighting, it just, it'd be very hard to set this up, which is why it can kind of look artificial. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. There is no, there's none. But if we come in here, we do this, we do color overlay, we pick this, and then bring this up a little bit, right? Um, we'll bring it up a little bit more just to just to be sure. And then I will get <laughs> I'll get rid of these hideous uh So So okay, now here. Where where where, where do we think we would be as far as value as far as like reflected reflected light? <laughs> the moon's just one big highlight, it's true. Um So we can use our math. We can use our, our algorithm that we just made up, doesn't exist really anywhere, but we just made it up, okay? What is the difference between our specular highlight as far as values? Okay, I'm gonna hide this so we can see the numbers together. Okay, so we have our specular highlight right here, which is at a 68, 68. Then we're going to come over here. So just think six. This is a six. The lighting is a six. And the ambient room is a nine. So barely a one. We'll, we'll bump it up. We'll bump it up to one. But what is that? A difference of five, right? Six and one. Sure. Okay. So this is at a nine. The brightest this bounce light can be, 9 minus 5 is 4. So let's check it. Oh, God. Ta-da! Oh wait, you can't see that? Yeah, because darks are exponential. They drop. The moment you get past a certain threshold, it don't matter anymore. It really doesn't. So technically we're correct. We added in the value, we did all that, and all of them, we followed the math and we did this. But this was kind of a trick question because it doesn't need bounce light. It doesn't need it, you're in the darks. Which is why it's important to keep those value scales as separate as possible. Would it matter if we brought it into Photoshop and changed the bit depth to 16 bit? Not really, I mean, maybe, but not enough to, I, I wouldn't, I'll put it this way, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Every single, client I have ever worked for ever 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 Adidas uh, Warhammer Riot Games it, it they all have 8-bit color every single one of them every single one so I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about the bit depth okay yeah it's I know it's anticlimactic I feel bad for fooling everybody but but I mean technically we did we raised that value a little bit little bit you know what I mean Neg negligible. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You, your time can be spent somewhere else. Okay. So now hopefully we saw kind of what the relativity part is. Okay. Now let's just look at some examples. Okay. So if anyone has any like direct questions, please send them in. Um, but I want to do, I, I'm going to, I took some notes on some stuff and I, I just want to talk about this a little bit, just to kind of bring this to a head. Um, tend to color grade with 16-bit depth. You think more industries will be using? Well, maybe photographers do. 
Maybe they do. I don't know. I, maybe, maybe like animation might. I, I'm just, I'm not familiar enough with it. But no, uh, because 8 bit keeps the uh, file size down. And whenever you're dealing with CMYK printers, in this regard of like tabletop role playing games and stuff like that, it doesn't matter as much. And in fact, it might actually be cheaper. I don't know how, but it might be. Um, if I want realistic values in a huge battle scene, how can I keep it structured throughout the process? We won't get values right the first time, but fixing one object may ruin everything next to it. Not if you lock in your values. And that's actually what we're about to talk about. Um, if you give yourself wiggle room in the midtones, we're going to look at literally a Craig Mullins that has thousands of people in this picture. If you set up your values correctly, not only will it answer that question, it'll do it without you thinking about it, which is the best type of answer because you don't have to put any more mental thought into it, right? How to apply all this straight to the point. Yeah, so that's that's called an art career <laughs> and that takes uh, five lifetimes, but yes. Um, a good photo does not make a good reference. Following a reference as good lighting for photos is going to be a nightmare for painting. Exactly. Because if you're doing a portrait and they soften out all those features, good freaking luck. Because they just blended all your values. There's no structure to it. It's impossible to paint. Okay. So. Let's, uh, let's look at Sue Key. Okay. So. Um, artist for Riot, main artist for Riot. I actually use Sue's brushes a lot. I love them dearly. Um, so I put mastering mood. You can master mood by controlling your full value range, um, smaller value scales versus the full range value scales. So this was a shorthand. It may not make sense, but I'll, I'll explain it real quick. Not every picture has to have every value. And I don't even mean like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm talking about you don't need this scale. You don't need it. You can get a baller picture just with these four. It's trickier. You gotta really be careful. And they don't even have to be next to each other. You can do a 70%, a 40%, and a 10%. And that's it. Once again, go back to three or go back to five. You're simplifying by giving yourself the highest highlight. Basically on a five point scale, what do you have? You have your highest highlight. You have your lightest midtone. You have your midtone, your darkest midtone in your shadow, right? And that's your five values. So that, that's how you differentiate it. And you never kind of stray from those. But you can stray from them. Once you get everything on there, and if something looks right, and the colors are blending and doing all the stuff, you can do whatever you want. But putting the picture down on the canvas is the important thing up front. And to keep your mind like straight on it, simplify it. Just keep it simple. Three values, two values, just pure black and white, who cares? Five values, you can do 10 values, but if you're getting in the weeds, um, I, the way I have been working in values probably the past year or so, and you guys have probably noticed it whenever I'm making a painting, I just tell myself, okay, I'll do the 10 and 20 and 30 for highlights. Um, I'll do 60 and 70 for my midtones and then 90 and hundred for my shadows. That's it. And then I can play all day I and mean, uh, I'm going to do these cool painterly effects with these three values as my lights. And then I'll do some cool, like muddy stuff in the in the midtones with these two values and really painterly and because you can smudge, you can blend, you can do whatever you want as long as you don't break your method, as long as you don't mix those values. Right? And Suki is a genius because that's what all of this is. If you ever wanted to know how to get this look, this nice, beautiful painterly look, that is pure value control, baby. Let's prove it. Let's go um, canvas, grayscale. Now see all that detail? It kind of went away, didn't it? It's still cool, but this is way more approachable than looking at the warm versus cool. 
that they have going on. So see here, the highlights, the highlights are the same value. Highlights are the same value across the painting. The sky is basically a mid-tone, allowing you to get the most pop out of your shadow, shadow. So should we avoid pure black and pure white? Yes. I would, I would personally stay away from both of them. The darkest I would get is probably like a 95%, which is still insanely dark. Insanely dark. Um, and then the lightest, you could do pure white. I mean, you can do whatever you want. You could do both. But I would shy away from them because that means you can also save them if you have a specular highlight that you know is going to be pure white. Save it to the very last brush stroke till you go boop. You'll see oil painters do this all the time. They will be working. They're going to mix their canvas. They're going to their, or their, their palette. They have the Zorn stuff. They have some cyan. They have some, all this other stuff. They have 55 colors and full value ranges and all this stuff. They're painting, 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 and a month goes by. And then the very end, they get their, their lead white or their titanium white. They put a little bit on the brush and go boop on the eye. And that's it. That's what they do. They save that for the very final mark because now you're getting a really cool engrossing picture and then that one little highlight, just, just a little bit. But if you use black and white during the painting, there, there's nowhere to go. Like you can't get lighter. You can't get darker. You put yourself into a box, which sounds nice sometimes, but like you, you want to give yourself some wiggle room. That's what makes for these nice, like, painterly looks. Same thing here. Majority of this stuff is mid-tones, guys. This is all playing in the mid-tones. I would say there's only... Here's a shadow. Here's a shadow. Or, or here, here we go. I, I beg your pardon. Here's a dark... Here is a dark. Here is a dark. Uh, yeah, and here's a dark. Great. But there's shadows everywhere. There's shadows up here. There's shadows right over here. There's the shadows here. Notice how the further this goes back, the contrast is crunched. So the darkest darks and the lightest lights are actually pretty close to each other on the value scale. This is this is this is illustration concept art 101. Right here. As it comes closer to us, you're getting darker. You're not really mixing your darkest darks with your lightest lights unless you want to get attention like you do here from the ability like you do here from the expression on the face like you do here with the sun hitting. So Yes, that's got ambient occlusion. Is that not right to do? You can. Ron Jaw does it. He has quite quite a great successful career. So far be it from me to. But yeah, but there's a reason why. It's not that he uses pure black or pure white, and it's the wrong or right thing to do. Just ask yourself why did they do it? Why? Why is pure black the right call there? You know what I mean. And then see, here's the other painterly stuff. You get these nice brush strokes and stuff, but very, very dark. Um, you know, some darks, some darks, but you know, nice shapes, readability. You know, we talk about that stuff. But now let's take a look at Suki's Valorant art. I know you guys brought this up in the Discord earlier, which is why I got this specific piece. They have quite a few of these pieces. You go for quote unquote a cell shading look whenever you don't blend your values, right? You have very strong geometric shapes, very strong geometric shapes, which is true. You can have that look. But what I find most interesting, watch what happens when I, I, I turn the color back on.
the real contrast is in the color harmony, in the color temperature. You have gold, you have magenta, you know, or yellow and magenta, right? So the same way that Suki is balancing the, 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 the shapes of, here's my highlight shape, it's up top, highlights, 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 also controlling temperature, right? And that's what you're getting. Exactly. There's not a whole lot of really dark shadow unless you're in a very specifically lit room. Light bounces off everything, man. But that explains the exponential value curve. There's way more light than there is shadow. Way more. Oh my, it's not even. It's like 100 to 1. So does blending cause one new value to be made? So if we blended out those cell shade areas, will they produce one new value or plane? No, not necessarily because of how close some of these values are. If they're only one step, if it's only a 10% and a 20%, and then you mix them and you get 15%, 15% does not become a new value. I mean, on numbers, I guess it does, but it really doesn't. You wanna know why? Because if you dedicated your 10 to 20%, to your midtones, okay, my midtones are gonna be from 10 to 30. It's literally a scale. If you mix anything between 10 and 30, you are still within the midtones. Which brings us to our next artist, Craig Mullins. If anyone kind of knows about how to do this whole value thing, it's this guy. So we talked about what about a battle scene with a thousand some odd people and all this other stuff. Take a look at this. Look at this painting. Look at how ridiculous this painting is. Look at this. Every stroke, every single nuance, every single deal. Just, just look at this, right? See these hits right here? A vast majority of this painting, I would say, 70% of this painting is midtones. There's very few actual like pure highlights here. And there's hardly any full on shadows or darkest darks. Okay, so this is a perfect example. If you introduced pure black to this picture, you would ruin it. You would absolutely destroy it. It wouldn't read well. It wouldn't make sense. You need the blown out sunlight that lights everything. There is no nothing. I mean, the closest thing you would have to pure black is like this. And this is red. So no, you would not have a pure black here. Even in the ambient occlusion. Look, that's just purple. Not black, but it is the darkest thing on the palette. So you have your darks. So I would say, let's actually prove this. Mode, canvas, grayscale. That's probably an 80% on the value scale. If we bring it back up. Let me do this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe between an 80 and a 90, but no way is it 100. There's no way that's pure black. No way. It's maybe here. I'd say it's between these two, right? And then the highlight. So is it a per room or lighting condition? Yes, there is. There is actually like, that is physics. Like you can't full physics. Light follows a very specific formula. And then based on the density of a structure that comes between it and its end goal, it's going to change the relationship by how light, what, like, that is a whole deal of science and that goes way, but, but at the end of the day, if you worry too much about that, you're no longer painting. You're no longer creating art because it doesn't matter if it's right or not. It matters if it's good or not. That's all this is. A value scale 
is something to help you keep things separated, help you keep things at a, a, a very close distance as far as understanding what we are looking at, being able to break around, break out the world around us, right? There are millions and millions and millions of values. There are millions. Human beings, I think the best trained eyes and stuff, it's hard to do that exact math, but I think we can see like 30,000 values, right? From the darkest darks of a cave and then our eyes and the rods and the cones and they expand and they change. Like we can see like 10,000 values or whatever. A lot more than 10. But as a painter, we want to simplify that. We want to make it as simple as possible to get the idea across. What makes something good if it's subjective? What are the objectives that make it good? Um, the world around us. If, if we look around the world and we see... We know what a tree looks like. We know what happens. If you went outside today and the theory of light and dark reversed, we would probably die. We would, our minds would break. We would be like, Duh, and then our nose would bleed and it'd be like we time traveled. And we, we, there's a certain reality. There's a way things are. It just is. And it's not anyone's real doing. I mean, based on your beliefs or whatever, maybe. But it is what it is. The sky's not blue, but it looks blue. So you can simplify it by saying the sky's blue. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is, once again, the value scale is important because it's a way to translate information. It is a way to... to signify that we are aware of the world around us. That's all this is. You know. Do you like building up contrast as you paint or starting with your limits and going in? So, funnel, funnily enough, that's a great point. I used to build it up as I painted. And I say used to because I'm trying to break my mind out of that habit. I should probably block in my extremes first. Then I know what my limits are. Then I know where I can like work around it. Yeah, paint what you see, not what you think you see. We think we understand the world, but we really don't. We we don't. We're, human beings are dumb. We're very dumb. Our ears barely work. Our eyes aren't too good. Our joints are bizarre. Like we like to think we're real fancy. We're not. So really looking at a thing and like, hmm, well, that's weird. Why does this reflected light catch this color instead of that color? Why, whenever I hold up this magnifying glass to this window and I'm looking over here, does the light do that? But I thought it would reflect over there. That's you're learning, man. You're bringing stuff up and like for every trope there is in concept art such as like pointy rock mountains and like guy with a stick and atmospheric perspective and all that stuff. It all exists. All that stuff is real. It, it exists in the world. It looks corny or it looks played out or whatever, but it's real. I've seen slices of light. People will make fun of the whole slice of light thing that artists do that I love doing because, you know, oh, it's a dark place. And then there's a slice of light. Literally, I have one of my paintings that has a slice of light in it. <laughs> To this one right here. Um, this happens. This happens in life. I don't know why. I ain't going to question it. I'm going to use it. Like hell, I'm going to use it. You better believe it, man. You kidding me? So, so that's, that's the idea. Um, we think too much about it. And we don't see it enough. Exactly. There's a certain point where you think so much and you stop initiating with the creative aspect of it. And we're so worried about solving a problem that we're creating new problems. But oh, but but this isn't right. And my art would be better if the light followed the actual theory of, you know, prismatic deviations of who cares? Like no one cares. No one cares. No one cares. How can we simplify that? Learn the technique, like learn what are we actually looking at? Oh, that's crazy. Light does this. Hmm. Can I use my value scale and replicate that? Sure. Go for it. That's how you make good paintings. 
you're abstracting the world around you. You're, you're doing the impossible task. You're either taking something from imagination, which is quadruply impossible, or you are looking at the world around you and transferring it onto a permanent record with your hands or mouth or feet or, you know, however you instigate and, and manipulate your creative, you know, visualization. It's impossible. It's an impossible task. That's why this is so hard. But that's why everybody has different tastes. Because somebody could see something and like, oh, I see how you got that. And I love that light. And I love that. And I love that. Someone else walks by, oh, that color green's wrong. And then they leave. You never know what people are looking for. You never know. Do you know what I mean? So we'll go back to Craig Mullins real quick. A few other things I want to show you before I wrap this up. Okay. I put this. This makes a lot of sense to me. Just saying. Lights only light the lights. All right. Lights only light the lights. And this is a perfect example of it. Okay. Lights only light the lights. I mean, actually, we'll just keep this grayscale. We'll keep it grayscale. Since we're working values, let's just keep it there. I mean, it is a really cool color. Like, I want you guys to see this because Craig Mullins is awesome. So, like, very nice yellows and all this stuff. And you have the nice cool right up here and all this other, you know, very, very just atmospheric and awesome. But the reason why this works... is because your light source, your brightest bright, right here, and right here, and right here, and right here, and right back here, these are all the same light source, and it is going through a structure at an angle. So if the light source is here, it's coming di diagonally in here. And then you see stippled lights, right? You see that line of lights. And then you see the light catching on these other things, right? So the light, your light values are only lighting the things being hit by the light. But then you take that math of all of these bits of light coming into these windows and it lights up the whole room so you're able to see it. But it's not a supernova. This is not equally lit everywhere because we have things in front of it. We have structured walls with the thickness and the density, but in the areas that we don't, meaning these open window ideas, you see hints of the lighter light coming through. So the light only lights the lights. It's a weird saying, and it seems stupid, but like these lights up here, you'll notice are not as bright or intense as the lights outside. You ain't getting brighter than the sun. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. The sun is the be all end all. As far as an artist is concerned, that's the be all end all. Your, your, your lights here. And in fact, I would bet this is like 30% on the, on the value scale. Well, this is like pure digital white light, basically. Because this is next to all your darkest darks, so you can get away with it being relatively light. Like, I bet this value and, like, this value are pretty close. But it's an optical thing. Like, you can look at a checkerboard technique and see all that about, you know, how, how dark does white look under the sunlight shadow. Like, that type of stuff. Um, whenever you start getting into perceptive reality and perceptive values, that's what you're looking at. So... But you're looking right here, and the same thing here, the form um, the form highlights and stuff. This is not as bright as our light source. But it's definitely brighter than our, uh, our ambient light right here, you know. A black and white painting, how does apply color, don't lose your brushwork. So, that's the thing, in my opinion. You can use a gradient map and it can grow to it. But in my opinion, you can't. Because once you separate your color from your brush stroke value, things look weird. So what I do is I get, I build up values pretty well. 
then I'll do a gradient map, then I'll do whatever. But then I use that to start painting on top of. I never, I never just make a painting like this and then gradient map it and kind of mask it away and then call it done. Never, never, never. Because I always want my brush strokes to follow my color. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, you can, once you get comfortable with value and color and chroma and the relationships between all of those, absolutely start in color. You're going to get a way more vibrant painting that way. Way more vibrant. But let's take a look at this. So majority of this is in the midtones. We talked about that. Or I think we started talking about it. But then there's very little, quote unquote, darkest darks. There's like, there's some right here. There's maybe some and remember we're we got to see what we see not what we think we see because right here we think oh this guy's under a canopy and then you know this is shadow and all this other stuff i don't care about that i care about how dark is it i don't care if it's a shadow or not i care about how freaking dark is it this sleeve is way darker than like up here it might be kind of close to here, right? But it's all relative. All of this is relative. And then you look at this. The only real highlights I can find in this painting, here's one. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe. Here, here's one. Is that it? And then maybe a few of these hats. And that's it. So it's not that light isn't hitting things, light's hitting everything. But what is your highest highlight? What is your zero or 10% on this scale? Only a very little bit. Not much, actually. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's kind of ridiculous. And then here, I wanted to show there's clear separations even in the darks. A vast majority of this painting is a 60% or darker. But then you have the nice little bit right here, this nice little value hit. Elephant head. Um, Maybe the design but not the head itself. No, the head itself would be like a 40 on the value scale. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, if we brought over this value scale right here. I mean, look at that. You know what I'm saying? So like maybe over here you can start getting some lights, but like the true highlights, true highlights, there's not very many. Like the hat maybe, maybe a few of these dots. But it's very, very minimal. Everything else is hanging out in the midtones. But his midtone range, because you're in a sunlit, there's nothing blocking the sun, your midtone range could be from 20% to 70% based on the chroma and the value and the color, right? But then your shadows, once again, we didn't see super, super, super dark darks that would be like a 90 or a 100. We didn't see any. Really, we saw a few, but not very many. Because even this, right here, the shadow of this person would be like a 60 or a 70. You know, maybe like a 70-ish, maybe an 80, kind of in between. It's all relative. Just know that if you, if you kind of start at about a 20 and make your dark limit about the 80 or the 90, you're gonna be okay. Perfect example. Perfect example, it's this portrait, of course, Craig Mullins. Soften transitions to add ambiance. So that whole idea of adding um, values to the scale, it won't happen. You're, you're condensing. So instead of thinking that as you're blending, you're expanding your value scale, think of it the other way. As you're blending, you're now literally conforming to your value scale. You're staying within it. You're not introducing anything on the outer parts. 
Does that make sense? So you're not actually adding values to the scale. It doesn't work like that. You, you have it as a solidified, like it can't get bigger than this. At the front of your picture, whatever mood you're going for, is it gonna be dark, is it gonna be light, majority midtones, whatever. You make your decision. Do not go outside of those extremes. Everything else is a field day. I would say keep your, you know, keep your darks and your shadows and stuff on the darker end. And like that logically makes sense, but you're not adding to it. You're not expanding your value scale. You're staying within it, right? So you got the highest highlight right here. Woo boy. That is a, that is a bammo bingo bongo. We got it. That's a number zero right there. If I've ever seen it. Um, and then you get a little bit of dappled, a little bit of something on the oil, a little oil catch right here, right? But then look at the rest of this. Yeah, you got a few darks, but that doesn't even get super dark. I think this is like a 90, maybe. Yeah, maybe a 90, but this doesn't even really get pure black. It looks pretty black, but it's not pure black. Um. But see how you have your darks are with your darks. Your midtones are with your midtones. You can have lighter midtones. You can have darker midtones, but they're still midtones. Even the shadow is a midtone. So instead of thinking it as light and shadow, the shadow has to be dark. Not really. Like this cast shadow is not very dark. It's just not. It's darker than the stuff around it. So it's relatively dark. But this is dark. Like, give yourself some of that wiggle room. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so we have that. Um, yeah, basically. And as you smoothen those transitions, that is less seen in nature. Well, it's seen a lot in nature, really. But whenever you soften those transitions, you're adding mood and ambience. You're adding that because now your eye has a place to rest. And you can really differentiate it with uh, with color. That's one of the things that you can introduce with color. Okay. And see right here. Perfect example. You see these beautiful color, beautiful colors. God, Craig's a genius. Um, so you see these. But then if we turn this back over, it's all kind of the same value. Right. You can see the, the shapes. But like this and this are almost identical values, right? But then you come over here and then that's a beautiful, nice warm. And then you have that cooler red right here. Depends on the local value, what you're painting exactly. And the intensity of the light source and the material it's made of. And none of this is easy. This is not easy. This is why this stuff takes years and years of practice to get really, really strong and good at. Um, so let's see. Oh, yeah, Madam X from Sergeant. Sure. Let me pull it up real quick. And then I will wrap this up. I promise. I promise because it's already 2.30 in the morning. Um, but like I said, I'm real passionate about this stuff, man. Um, Madam X, John Singer, Sergeant. Portrait of Madam X. Okay. So, this... Let's see if, uh, will this allow me to save it? Probably not. Move this over here. Can I drag it? Can I? No, I can't. Okay. I'll, fi I'll find a good version of it, unless someone has it in chat and they want to send it. Um, images. Okay. Oh, here we go. Here's a good one. Um, open image, new tab. No, god dang it. There it is. Okay. Boom. All right. What do we want to know on Madam X by John Singer Sargent? God, look at those <laughs> Oh, buddy. Woo. 
Now you're cooking with gas right there, man. Look at that. You want to talk about shapes? Bingo. You know. So yeah, you want to talk about your lights and your midtones and your darks. We talked about three values. You can do a almost perfect master study of this exact painting using pure black, pure white, and 50% gray. So yes, it's true. There is stuff in the middle. There is stuff in the middle. You can use that whole value scale. And in fact, John Singer Sargent kind of looks like he did. But the readability of this comes from the separation of values. That's why a value scale is important. It's not because, uh, well, technically, theoretically, it says this and this. That part at a certain level doesn't matter. Can I tell what I'm looking at? Yes, it is a woman holding her dress up, leaning against a table, looking up in a direction on a blank background. That's exactly what this picture is, and there's no mistaking it for anything else. And it's because the values read correctly. Period. It doesn't get any harder than that. Doesn't even get any easier than that either. Like, you simplify into this. This is why this works so well, right? With two, yeah, he's a madman. He's an absolute, like, there's a reason why John Singer Sargent should be studied by every person who wants to be a professional illustrator or painter. The guy's, a, I mean, uh, unbelievable. Look at this one speck of white. One for the entire ring. Look at that. It's perfect. It's one dot. So that's what I meant earlier. Save yourself pure black and pure white because you might need it for that. You might need it for the little dot of a ring. See what I'm saying? Unbelievable. It's perfect. It, I mean, it, it's a perfect painting. No notes. <laughs> you know, yeah, and look at the highlights of the dress. Exactly, these highlights, this form highlight, because it's getting caught by the light, is way darker than the light being hit off the skin because of the material, because of the reflectivity, because of the way the light's going to bounce. It's unbelievable. It's truly, I mean, it's a remarkable painting. So great idea, bringing it up. Um, and then, um, so we got those, we got the full range thing. Okay, now I want to show you guys examples of my work and then kind of wrap it on that. So literally, I made this painting right here and I can show you the, well, I can show you the, uh, ooh, pretty colors, warm and cools and stuff. I did this one for YouTube, of course. Uh, made this one for Halo, um, got commissioned by them. And then this is part of the uh, landscape, the um, landscape tutorial I have on sale on my website. So I knew for a fact when I painted this one, I wanted a primary um, value scale of lights. Now it didn't mean that I didn't bring in some darks, but if you look here, it's very rough and rugged. It's really like, I didn't need a whole lot of them. I did a few. I did it just to kind of show the form changing on these rocks. But yeah, it's not detailed by any means. But see, I brought in a little bit of something. That way, when you zoom out and you look at this thing, it reads okay. But it's because I didn't break my rule on having my highlights and my midtones. Okay? And then, yeah, the quote-unquote highlight of this rock is actually darker than the midtone of the clouds. Which makes sense. It's closer to us. It's going to be darker and it's going to have a higher contrast. And by contrast, I literally mean the distance we go on our value scale. High contrast means it is a further distance. Your lights could be at 10 and your darks could be at like 90. A compressed or, or, or less contrast 
means there are less steps in between your lights and your darks. And like, that's why I kind of wanted to show as we go further in the background, my lights and my darks kind of turn into the same thing. And you see, I put some cool paint texture and all that stuff on there. But that part's not super important. What is important is it gives the idea that there's more density than there really is. Because it's, but you're still playing within that small contrast value range. But then as you come further out, now this difference between this light and this dark is a little bit more. It's a further distance. Then we get even closer. And there you go. See, you're introducing more of a drastic change of elongating that we're still within the same value scale. So we're still working relatively light until we get here. And then you have your bigger, you know, your bigger structural. Well, that's true. Yeah. I mean, and the importance, and you can see, so me introducing this soft brush was not necessarily bringing in a new value because it still followed the rule that we already established. It's still low contrast. It's still lighter than the stuff around it. It's a little darker than this, but that's because this is coming over this mountain. So it's actually closer. So it will be a little darker. Once again, it's relative. This relative to this is darker or lighter. Okay, same thing. In fact, I would probably, one thing I would probably want to do if I were to revisit this, I would make this rock structure lighter in value, just overall. And I would make the, the value scale, like the, the, the distance between it, match closer to this rock. Because I think this rock is a little too close. It kind of throws off what is the actual distance that we're looking at, in my opinion. Because I wanted these to be the type of rocks that are a little bit, they're big enough that you can stand on and kind of look out. But it's the give and the take. I wanted it to be dramatic and to do that, you kind of have to break the rule a little bit, but that's a whole different ballgame, right? But just, just know I worked primarily in my lights here, right? So boom, majority of my painting is on the very, uh, on this end, of the value scale, right? 30% or here. It's a vast majority of it. So the darks, same thing. I did the inverse of this. So where I wanted a little bit of like seasoning, think of it like a food, a little bit of seasoning. We got some darks, it's a little seasoned. I wanted to season this dark area with a little bit of light just a little just a touch a smidgen there's a little bit of light here which means it could be a cave that you could explore we have the light hitting right here because it just look cool it's a slice of light why not and then you have a little bit of light up here i don't think this reads super well up here i'd fix this if i were to go back and redo it but we were in tutorial mode so i was just adding stuff to add it <laughs> on the tutorial but you can see a vast majority of this piece exists purely in the like i would say even like 80 to 90 to 100 percent right and even this isn't a few of these are pure black but like it's also against very very dark anyway so it can still work you just have to like introduce it to your audience you can't go from like a mid-tone to pure black or it's going to look way off you have to slowly get them used to things coming towards you are darker so then you can get darker than this and it's this and then darker than this is this and then darker than this is that once again it's relative it's all relative compared to itself um from the light beam in the cave yeah so it's like this type of thing right and even though this is a highlight since it's further back it's actually not big contrast it seems like it is because it's next to something that is high contrast, which is this rock, these kind of pebbles, and this light. So that was the goal. I wanted to build something that had, yeah, it had mood. It had some sort of ambience to it. 
I wanted to do it as an exercise just to see if the theory worked. And it did, it did. Um, you can do the same way you do the math of something being further away from you as lighter. That same rule applies here, because it is. It's still very dark because our color key, our light key is dark, but the highlights, quote unquote, are only at like a, maybe a 50 or a 40. There's a few that are probably around 20, these brighter brights, but there's no pure white on here at all. Cause I didn't want to cr I didn't want to kill that, that mood, the, the density of the air as it were, you know? Yeah, it is the theory that it is the theory of relativity. All of this is relative. And then I actually wanted to show you the the halo piece and talk about that at the very end cuz I think part of this the values were correct, but I could tell I made this early in my career. Because parts of the values are wrong. They're just actually flat out not correct. Um so I had a lot of fun with this one. I had a whole lot of fun with this one. I thought it was super rad. Um, that I got to work for Halo. That was really cool. Got featured, all that good stuff. This is also using my very first brush pack, um, the 2019 brush pack, maybe. I might go revisit that and repurpose some of them for the 2025 because I like the look of a lot of this stuff. So this basically, I remember my, my, my theory at the time was, okay, the highest contrast is going to be the character you know, noble or noble team or whatever you want to call it. Cause this was for Halo reach, um, or as a waypoint showcase for Halo reach, I guess. Um, I wanted the darkest darks and the lightest lights, both on the character. And we, we succeeded in that. We have our highest highlight exactly kind of next to the darkest dark, which I like it breaks the rules a little, but who cares? I think it looks cool, <laughs> but what doesn't look cool. In my opinion, this dark is a little too dark because you lose out on the form. This dark's actually fine because we don't need to even know what's in here. This is the underarm. This is kind of the undercarriage, all that stuff. Doesn't matter. Where it gets a little hairy for me, it gets a little, mm, I could have maybe nah, tightened that up. I could have done this. And we'll see it more with color, but right here I don't quite know what that is and why it would catch that much light I mean it looks fine because we've already established it can have the brightest brights and like we have bright brights here and all this other stuff so hey another bright bright and it you know puts it away from the the background or whatever but I don't think it works I, I think I need to actually bring this down to be closer to these two values rather than a highlight. I can keep the highlight on the gun. Maybe I can even add a highlight to this part of the gun. It's kind of the butt of it facing the light. But I don't think that works. I also don't think this rust area works all that well. Because this is hard to tell what's happening. What's happening here? Is the light coming in and hitting this? If so, why is it not also hitting this? Because it's following the same form and it's made out of the same material and nothing is blocking the light from shining on it. So what's the deal? The rest of it's fine. It's loose, loosey-goosey, painterly. You get the gist of it. But those were the two main things. Um, I did also want to point out, I would probably actually extend this out more instead of this dark coming in because this dark shouldn't actually be darker than this doorway you know Th they should flip I think these two values should flip but I actually don't think that this doorway should be this dark because I don't want this taking away from the character in fact all of this should probably be a little lighter it should not be this light but like lighter and then I think the whole piece would work better I can refine my edges more, I can do all that, but it's still working within the value scale. All right? So, the material of his armor would behave this way? Maybe. Maybe it could. We can get away with that. 
Sure. Um, but maybe it wouldn't. And that's one of those choices you have to kind of make as the artist. You know what I'm saying? So, and, and you can really see the rust thing if I come in here. It's just off a little bit. It's a little too vibrant. It's a little too light. Doesn't make much sense. If I were to taper this down to be here and then just use these highlights down to, to differentiate the changes of forms, I think it would be a better, more, more profound impact, if that makes sense. But yeah, guys, that's it. That was only, what, a two-hour-long YouTube video? <laughs> um, but this is it. This is this is rap, but really just remember this stuff. Value is always, 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 always relative. Always. Keep your scale. Try your best not to cross your streams. Don't put your highlight or your lights in with your midtones. Don't do it. Don't put your shadows in with your midtones. Don't do it. Definitely don't put your shadows with your lights. Don't ever do it. But if there's one value that does bridge them, be sure you handle it with care. You can do it, but be very, very sure. Change it with a temperature of color. Do something else to contrast it. The value can match, but there has to be something else or else you're going to get a weird read. It's going to look like a tangent. Your brain's not going to quite know what you're looking at. So there's a lot like that. Um, yeah, cross your streams. Have you ever thought about doing overpaint videos where you take some submitted paintings from people and kind of fix them? So funny you mention that. We will be kind of doing that um, at the end of this month. I will be doing a stream and it will be part of the YouTube deal. Um, so hey, YouTube. Um, <laughs> um, hit like and subscribe if you haven't already but we will be doing a stream where we're going to be doing critiquing of the community's uh, painting so let me cut over here real quick um, let me go to bam beautiful so we will be doing that we will absolutely wait it cut off that one too that's silly that's silly don't mind the the chat looking weird. I had to crop it on the other screen and it cropped it over here, which is dumb. But anyway, um, we will be doing that at the end of August. I will have a link up and a video up that will show some critiques, some overpainting. We're going to be talking about some theory the same way we talked about value. Um, but we're going to, we're going to look at some stuff and there's some great art submitted already. I'm super excited to dig into all of it. Um, everyone is a freaking rock star. So I'll have a link to the Discord in the YouTube description below. Uh, so yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, thanks so much. That's my time. You guys have been fantastic. And, and we'll see you next time. Deuces.